Um, so starting on cases, today we're gonna to do Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education. Um, what you need to know about this case that differentiates it from the previous case we did. Um, so thinking back to you know, basically two weeks ago, uh, we finished off with Green versus County School Board. Um, Swan, the major difference here is that the Chief Justice of the court has changed. Um, so the court itself as a body uh, in terms of its population has changed. Right now uh, in Swan, we have Chief, Stuff, Chief Justice Berger, and Chief Justice Berger was appointed by uh, Richard Nixon. And so we have a conservative um, leading the court as opposed to uh, Earl Warren, who was, as you remember, exceedingly um, liberal. This is the last time really that the court is unanimous in a school desegregation case. Um, the Swan marks a, uh, a sort of changing point for the court and the court, even though it's being led um, by a conservative, still continues in the vein of making uh, sort of exceedingly, or exceedingly liberal opinions. Um, so the Chief Justice Berger writes the unanimous opinion and, and sets out in the beginning, uh, right up from up front, that the objective today remains to eliminate from public schools all vestiges of state-imposed segregation. So to give you a little context about what Charlotte looked like at this time and, and when the court was hearing the case in 71, is that two thirds of African-American children went to schools that were 99% black. So Charlotte, despite you know, Brown v. Board and provide all the, despite all the other cases that intervened from then till 1971, Charlotte still existed as an overwhelmingly segregated school system. Um, so in this case, the Supreme Court basically says that you can do a number of things to stop this and to impose integration. So if you remember, we, we have been talking about how the court moved from desegregation to integration. And this is very much, this is probably the um, biggest example of integration that the court puts, that the court puts, court puts forward. So it, the federal court or the Supreme Court gives the federal district court judges who were um, in charge of these, uh, in charge of the um, desegregation in this area, they give them three ideas by which that they can actually use um, to attempt to integrate these schools. First, they said you can alter the school zones. So simply redrawing of the school zones to a significant degree um, will help in terms of integrating these school systems. But redrawing school districts, if you, if you remember to our discussion about why I live on the west side of El Paso and the majority of you live on the east side of El Paso, even if we were to draw school districts in such a way uh, it would still mean that predominantly individuals um, who are white live on the west side of El Paso and Hispanic individuals live predominantly on the east side of El Paso. Well, drawing school districts in that sense wouldn't really solve that because school districts are by their definition local. So even though the Supreme Court is saying one of the things that you can do is alter school districts, that's not really um, a solution to integration. Another thing that they put forward in this opinion is that the idea is that when you're assigning individual schools, you can also use as a starting point, not as a check at the end, a starting point, you can use quotas. Um, and quotas are simply uh, a means by which the court says you can allocate X number or X percent of individuals that the school uh, need to be African American. They say that's a useful starting point because and, and we'll get back to this a little later in further cases, if you use quotas as the decision point, then you are by definition violating the Equal Protection Clause. So the court says here that quotas are informative, but they shouldn't be decisive. And the last and perhaps most controversial thing that the court says in Swan that it can put forward um, is that if we, that the district court judges can use and mandate busing. So what is busing? So what, busing would in essence do, would allow um, the district court to bus individuals from concentrated clustered residencies uh, externally. And so this would help break up that pattern of African-Americans living predominantly uh, in the centers of cities and whites predominantly living in suburbs. And by busing, you can sort of exchange um, 
where those individuals live and make the schools more integrated. Now, this was overwhelmingly controversial at the time uh, and remained controversial until these busing policies went away. Um, the Supreme Court was very clear that this busing as a solution was not just to apply only to African American students, but that students, regardless of their racial identity, would be bused. And the reason why the Supreme Court went this far is because they wanted a plan that was reasonable, feasible, and workable, and one that would actually work now, work immediately. Um, if you think back to Brown too, when the court says that you must you know, desegregate with all deliberate speed, in 1971, Chief Justice Berger writes a very different opinion and says that we need one that integrates these school systems right now. Um, and so this plan of busing, as the court saw it, was a way to actually accomplish that goal as quick as possible. Um, and so the court gives these district judges a significant amount of power in order to enforce integration. Um, and, and these district judges overwhelmingly use it. To give you a kind of context in, in what this means, so this case is handed down in 1971. In the year 2000, the district court judge that oversaw the Charlotte system ruled that desegregation had finally been achieved and that busing and other court-ordered remedies need no longer apply. So it took almost 30 years for the district court judge who was in charge of the district uh, in question in the Supreme Court case to actually put an end to court-ordered busing and also redrawing of districts and everything like that. So 30 years since the case happened was how long it took for the Charlotte school system to actually be run exclusively by the, the Board of Education, by exclusively by the board system. For the entire 30 years, it was overseen by the local district court judge. Um, this case was critiqued as a fairly heavy-handed approach. Um, and I, I, I hope you all can see why that is. Um, mandating busing meant that in many situations, um, students, were on a bus for over an hour um, before school and after school. We don't tend to think of, at least when I think back when I rode a school bus in high school, um, the trips were never that long. Um, if you were the last kid dropped off, you probably were looking at 30 minutes tops. Um, but in this case, the average time was an hour round trip. So it, it was seen as a great deal of imposition placed upon these students to sort of mandate this idea um, of integration. And it, it's interesting to think back to what Harlan's dissent was in Plessy. Remember, in Plessy writes that the Constitution itself is colorblind. To a degree, that's the decision we get in Brown, uh, is that the, con the Constitution cannot in any way, shape, or form be construed following the passage of the 14th Amendment to allow us to make decisions and choices based upon race and ethnicity. That colorblindness of the Constitution is sort of written into law there. But in Swan, the court almost completely ignores that and says that quotas are the way to move forward, that busing solely on the basis of race is a way to move forward, and that redrawing districts solely on the basis of race is, is the way to move forward. So we, we moved to the, away from the idea that the Constitution is colorblind and that the mechanisms that are used to solve these inherent, inherent problems with our school systems have to be looked at on the basis of race, that race is the reason why um, we need to do this integration, and this integration can only be accomplished um, by understanding and recognizing the racial disparities that are going on in the area. Um, and these busings didn't just happen in the South. I mean, obviously this case uh, comes out of North Carolina, um, but busing systems were used throughout the North as well. Perhaps one of the most um, uh, broad examples that, that I could give you was in Detroit. Um, where busing pretty much mandated that the almost exclusively white suburbs in Detroit um, exchange uh, students via busing with inner city Detroit, which was, over, which was and still is overwhelmingly African-American. Um, 
So this case was applied not only to de facto systems that were found in the South, systems that very clearly discriminated on the basis of race, um, but was also, or I'm sorry, applied in the South to de jure systems, which exclusively discriminated on the basis of race, but also de facto systems like those which were found in the North, um, which didn't very evidently in the law discriminated on the basis of race, but because of housing patterns and everything else we've discussed previously, that this sort of busing was seen as a means by which to um, solve integration both in de jure segregated systems and also de facto um, segregated systems. Are there any questions uh, about the Swan case uh, before we move forward? <laughs> 